This video is about the basics of waves. We're going to look at what a wave is, the basic definition, different types of waves, and also basic properties that waves have in common. As I go through this information about waves, I'm going to be referring several times and using some pictures and animations from this website link you'll see right here. These animations were made by a man named Dan Russell at the Penn State University. I'll take you to his website now. I really can't say enough good things about this website. It's full of great information, uh, especially if you're looking for a little bit deeper information about waves. So many different kinds of waves, um, and it goes right from where we're going to start here in Physics 20 all the way up into university studies. It's just a great resource. So as far as the basic definition of a wave, a wave is a movement of energy. And energy is the important thing here. Um, while there are particles moving, it's not the motion of the particles that we call a wave. It's the motion of the energy. So for example, I'll take you to the first animation from Dan Russell here. Here's a wave of people. And you'll notice that the wave proceeds along the length of the people, but the people themselves only move up and down. So it's the energy moving that we call a wave. And I'll scroll down to another example. So this could be, for example, a rope. This rope is uh, having a wave put through it. So I'm going to copy a snapshot of that one onto our notes. Um, a few terms to start off with. The thing that actually does the making of the wave we call the source. So the source is what initiates the motion of the wave. It's what causes the wave. And another important one is the medium. Now the medium is what the wave is traveling through. So we could say, for example, this could be through a rope or it could be through a spring or something like that. That's what we call the medium, what the wave is traveling through. So basically the source starts oscillating the medium and then the wave travels through the medium. Now the energy of the wave moves through the medium and the medium itself ends up in the same spot as it started. Now while I'm talking about a medium, let's notice that if a wave has a medium, we call it a mechanical wave. There are waves that do not travel in any medium and those are electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves are really an oscillating electromagnetic field. So there, you do not need a medium for a field. So it's, it's an oscillating or alternating field. And a good example of this is light waves. So light does not need a medium. That's why light can travel through a vacuum in space. And it is still a wave. It's an oscillating field. You'll see that most of the properties for the rest, any of the things that we talk about when we talk about waves, are basically comparable between these two. So that was two different definitions in terms of medium, two different types of waves we can have. Now I'm going to make sort of a totally different distinction between two types of waves, and this is going to be about their, their shape and the direction of their motion. So the first one is called transverse. And transverse waves are kind of what we normally think of when we say or when we talk about a wave. So this picture that I drew up here is actually a transverse wave. So if we would continue oscillating that source, our wave might look like it goes up and down, up and down, up and down continually. And of course, it's in motion. But the thing is with transverse wa transverse waves is that when we're moving our point source up and down, this is perpendicular to the direction that it looks like our wave is traveling. So our direction of propagation, we might call it, which is like if you would watch a hump, what direction it's going to go. That's what we call the direction of propagation. This is perpendicular to the actual oscillation that happens in our rope or in our medium. So that's the key for a transverse wave, that the oscillation is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. I'm going to zoom in on another one of Dan Russell's diagrams. So if you'd imagine zooming in on that rope, this is what you'd see. The rope particles are moving up and down while the wave seems like it's traveling to the right. So the direction of oscillation is up and down and the direction of propagation is to the right. 
So the other type of wave is called the longitudinal wave. And you might be wondering what other possibilities there are for moving, but I'll show you again on Dan Russell's page. So here's Dan Russell's animation of a longitudinal wave. And you'll see that what it is is the source oscillates back and forth in the same direction or parallel to the propagation of the wave. Now I want you to study this animation pretty closely and again I encourage you to go to his website on your own time and look for yourself. But you'll notice that the particles, which there's a few highlighted in red, they move back and forth, back and forth. It's still not matter that's moving along the wave overall. The matter moves back and forth and the energy is what moves along and forms our wave which is highlighted by the black arrow on the bottom. So again, I'm going to borrow just a snapshot of that and write the definition here in our notes. For a longitudinal wave, the oscillation has to be parallel to our direction of propagation. So they're both moving in the same direction. Now this is a super important kind of wave because sound is one of is a wave like this. Sound moves as a longitudinal wave. There are compressions in the air and what are called rarefactions in the air. So these terms down here are actually quite important too. Compressions and rarefactions are what make up a longitudinal wave. Now I want to make a comparison between these two types of waves and show why they're essentially not all that different. Let's think of what's going on in this wave as being, well, we know they're compressions. So let's say, let's call that alternating areas of high pressure and low pressure, right? We know there's air, so for example, for sound in the air, there's areas of high pressure, which are called compressions here, and there's areas of low pressure, and these are alternating, high, low, high, low, high, low. And this is really the key to comparing these two types of waves, because if I would look at those areas of high pressure and low pressure, imagine graphing those areas over the distance. So I'm going to have pressure on the one axis and displacement on the other, and I'm going to graph this longitudinal wave. Well, what would it look like? Well, here's going to be my pressure axis, and here's going to be my displacement axis. And let's suppose that I start on an average pressure, and then I come to a compression. Well, compression is an area of high pressure. Then it goes back down into a rarefaction, which is an area of low pressure. Then it goes back to high pressure, and then it goes back to low pressure. And hey, what do you notice here? Well, this looks exactly like a transverse wave. So now it should be obvious that the essence of these two different types of waves is really not all that different. They might look very different from the start, but what's actually going on is not all that different, and we can compare them by this pressure displacement graph. Now I want to talk about some terms. So again, I'm going to take our two different types of waves, a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave, and I'm going to label some different things. So the first ones I mentioned already are compressions and rarefactions. So compressions, obviously, are where the particles are close together, high pressure. Rarefactions are where they're far apart. Now, the other kind of wave, the transverse wave, also has these things, but we call them with different names. So that would be like equivalent to the top and the bottom on this wave here. The top is what we call a crest, and the bottom is what we call a trough. Um, so for example, if you're describing a water wave, you can describe the top as being a crest and the bottom as being a trough, or a wave along a spring or a rope. The next term I want to look at is what's called the wavelength. The wavelength is simply the distance from one wave to another. So if I would measure, for example, exactly between two crests, I would call this the wavelength. And the wavelength is indicated by this Greek letter lambda. So that's what we call the wavelength. And that's, we just like Greek letters in physics. Um, I guess we run out of English ones. So you should recognize that in your formulas. And that lambda just stands for wavelength. Now just to be clear, you could measure wavelength from the crests. Um, it's of course going to be the same if you measure wavelength between the troughs. Or as a matter of fact, suppose you would pick the equilibrium position. Let me just sketch the equilibrium position along here. Uh, you could of course measure wavelength from one equilibrium position to the next. Now don't get confused by the fact that it looks like it skips one. but 
a wavelength has to take into account a complete cycle. So from when the wave starts at one point till it's back there, but it also has to be moving in the same direction. So wherever you measure wavelength, it should be the same. So of course, on our longitudinal wave, then wavelength would be the distance between any two compressions, or of course, also between any two rarefactions. Some of these are easier to see than others, but this is one wavelength. Now I did compressions on both of these, but that's okay. And finally, I want to talk about the term amplitude. Amplitude is the distance that the wave travels from equilibrium. So in this rope or wave or water, whatever it may be, this distance, the maximum displacement of the wave, is what we call the amplitude. And again, of course, we could measure it at any point. If there's not any sort of dampening going on, then it's going to be the same. We could measure it to a crest. We could measure it to a trough. Now, this one might be a little bit more of a more difficult concept for a longitudinal wave. But again, remember, it's about how far the source was oscillating. So to make our longitudinal wave, of course, we had a source here. And if you'll remember on the animation, this source here was moving back and forth. Okay, so the distance that this source moves is what we call the amplitude, and it's usually just abbreviated by a capital A. And you might be thinking, well, the amplitude looks to me like it would have to be exactly the same as the wavelength. Well, that's not necessarily true. The wavelength is really about how fast the wave moves through a medium. Uh, if a wave travels really fast through a medium, the wavelength is going to be bigger, whereas the amplitude doesn't depend on the medium at all. We'll see this a little more when we get into more detail on these sort of things. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to waves, and once again an encouragement to go have a look at Dan Russell's web state at the Penn State University.